On the afternoon of November 19, 2012, a 911 call was placed to the police department of Spankingham County, Florida. 911, what's the nature of your emergency? Uh, I've, I've got a bit of a quagmire on my hands here. Can you tell me your name and current address? Yeah, it's, uh, my name is Stuart Pecan, and my address is... Okay, Stuart, what's going on today? Um, I just got home from school, and I, I went into the living room to watch some family guy, and, uh, there's, uh, my whole family, uh, uh, my whole family is dead. Okay, Stuart, just relax and stay on the line with me. We've got police on the way right now. Okay, um, okay, I gotta go now. Stuart? Oh. Uh. Jeez. Don't hang up. Uh, Don't hang up. What the deuce? Stuart? Stuart? Authorities responded to the call and arrived on scene shortly after. Nothing could prepare them for the shockingly brutal crime scene they were about to step into. Responding officer George Clanton was the first to arrive at the scene. He was looking for 16-year-old Stuart Pecan, the one who had originally placed the 911 call. However, oddly enough, Stuart was nowhere to be found. After making himself some toast, Officer Clanton ventures into the living room. What he would see next would shock him to his core. Oh, shit. In the living room lay the slain corpses of 51-year-old Cindy Pecan, 47-year-old Louis Pecan, 19-year-old Julie Pecan, and 12-year-old Dewey Pecan. All four family members had been viciously stabbed to death, their bodies neatly laid side by side. Officer Clanton steps outside to declare the family house a crime scene. That's when suddenly he notices Stuart Pecan approaching. Excuse me, are you Stuart Pecan? I'm having a snack attack right now, I can't talk. In contrast from his tone on the 911 call, Stuart seems oddly calm and more focused on his snacks than the current situation. After experiencing a traumatic event, it's not uncommon for a subject to come off as eerily apathetic. Dissociation is a trademark characteristic of shock. This could explain Stewart's lack of attention given to the officer. Or it could be a sign of something more sinister that lies deep within. Trying to gather more context into what unfolded, Officer Clanton continuously finds himself being ignored by the snacking suspect. With Pecan's big bottomless bag of bizarre behaviors, paired with a growing list of unanswered questions, Authorities waste no time in taking Pecan back to the station for questioning. The following never-before-seen footage has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed professional counselor, a licensed attorney, a former criminal investigator, and a former mobile waste technician specialist with an associate's degree in quantum criminology. Okay, 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 here's another one. Why do women have boobs? So you get something to look at while you're talking to him. Yeah, I'll ask you to turn that off, please. I'm Detective Stuckman. This is Detective Walker. We're here to ask you some questions okay. pertaining to what happened in your home earlier today. Stewart, now the main suspect in his family slaying, watches the detective closely, seemingly holding his breath. His body language and facial expression are clear indicators that he could be hiding something. You, what you listened to when we came in? What was that? It's just a uh, family guy, funny moments on YouTube. It's my favorite show. In his free time, Stewart would host the YouTube channel Everything Cohog, where he would provide commentary on the many aspects of the animated Fox sitcom Family Guy. His videos would include episode discussion, merchandise reviews, and fan theories based on popular characters. With a breathtaking 8,000 subscribers and continuing growth and support from his viewers, it would have appeared that the sky was the limit for young Stewart. At this point, the detective is well aware of Stewart's peculiar obsession with Family Guy, but still, he indulges in a friendly manner to establish rapport and make the suspect feel comfortable. I, uh, yes, Family I have seen that I, that I think that's Peter Griffin. Right? Yeah. I haven't seen that particular episode, but I, yeah, I, well, I recognize he's running, he's running and he hits his knee on the mailbox and he goes, ah, ah, ah. It's freaking so funny. Albeit a good impression, Detectives Stuckman and Walker are careful not to laugh at this bit, as they don't want it to be misconstrued as flirtation. Shortly after this, 
you'll notice Detective Stuckman begins a clever maneuver known as the whoopsie-daisy tactic. This is when the so-called good cop claims to have made an honest mistake, in this case, forgetting his water, giving him an excuse to leave the suspect alone with the so-called bad cop, heightening the pressure. Um, anyways, I wanted to get started, but uh, I knew I forgot something. Uh, I had a water. I get thirsty pretty easily, you know. We're probably gonna be here a bit. Could I grab you anything? Y yeah. Water? Okay. Uh. Detective Walker now sits with the suspect silently, creating a sense of unease, prompting the suspect to speak first. So am I going to get to go home today? So am I going to get to go home today? Detective Walker strategically employs what is known as the mimic gimmick, also referred to as the copycat technique. This is where the detective will copy, mimic, and mock the suspect to their best ability, breaking down the suspect's confidence and establishing authority. Am I? Am I? You copying me? You copying me? Stop! Stop! Detective Walker kept this up for an impressive 48 minutes before finally breaking the pattern. And what he does next will drastically escalate the interrogation. Got your nose. You cooperate, you might get this back. What you just witnessed was a successful execution of a rare interrogation tactic known as the Oop I Got Your Nose method, more formally known as the Orenthal James Simpson technique. This is where the detective will take the suspect's nose, only for it to be used as a bargaining chip for later in the interview. If the suspect wants his nose back, he knows he'll have to cooperate with investigators. Now awaiting the detective's return, the suspect engages in self-soothing actions, such as massaging the frenulum of his penis. In doing so, the suspect is hoping to gain some semblance of calm, no doubt in anticipation of the impending questions he's sure he'll be asked. Detective Stuckman re-enters the room to continue the interview. You know, I saw Detective Walker in the break room. I think he, uh... I think he had your nose. He was showing it off the entire room anyways. People were having a good laugh at it. It's a beautiful nose. It's really, it's, it's a nice nose. Thank, thank you. If I were you, I'd want that nose back. I do. And I think I could help you get that nose back. Think of it, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. It's at this point in the interview Detective Stuckman finds himself jonesing for some chocolates. He faintly recalls having two Hershey's Kisses in his desk drawer. He leaves the room in search of the sugary sweets. This act, plus consuming the candies, was incredibly taxing for the detective, who in turn decided to take a short nap in his office. Refreshed and refilled, he returned to resume the interview two hours and 36 minutes later. All right, Stuart. You can, uh, you can call me Stewie. Okay, just a nickname. Yeah, uh, I feel like it just fits me better than Stuart. Okay, that's interesting, because if I remember you... You... Tried to legally have your name changed to Stewie. Stewie Griffin. Actually, can you tell me a bit about that? Through a Freedom of Information Act request, we obtained court documents which revealed Stewart had recently attempted to have his name legally changed from Stewart Pecan to Stewie Griffin. This attempt was unsuccessful, however, as his mother and father had both declined to sign off on the request. Stewie Griffin just felt like it uh, reflected like me as a person more so I just I wanted to just I felt like that was me as Stewie Griffin not not um 
Go on. What you just witnessed was the near-perfect execution of a tactic only the most skilled and knowledgeable detectives can dare to attempt. Known as the Nananana-Boo-Boo technique, the detective flashes a sudden mocking gesture while the suspect is mid-sentence. This will serve to derail the suspect's train of thought, making it much harder to keep track of his fibs. Due to the angle of the camera, it's difficult to determine the exact silly face made by Detective Stuckman. However, we hired a skilled spatial computer graphic system engineering specialist to create a three-dimensional render composite of what the suspect likely saw. So I started to, to do the name change, and it took like, I got like four months into it, but I had to, my, my parents at the last minute refused to um, sign off on it, so I, I... Stewart does his best to ignore the jesting detective's gesture gesture. However, it's apparent it's been successful in tripping him up. Pushing through the suspect's annoying ramblings, Detective Stuckman is setting the stage for what he's about to do next. I wasn't able to get my name changed. Your parents didn't allow you to change your name? No. Were you upset because of this? I know a lot of people have attachment to their identities and names being probably the biggest signifier of your identity. Yeah, I was pissed as crap about it. It made me, like, really freaking pissed. But not like, not like I do it. Did you catch that? Here, we'll play it again. Take notice of Detective Stuckman in the bottom right. Compounding on the recent Nana Nana Boo Boo, the detective deploys its sister technique, the Neener Neener. It leaves the suspect speechless. So let's talk about today. So I left school at the last bell, and then I, I went straight home, and I got home, and I opened the front door, and uh, it was really quiet. So I went to go put on some Family Guy in the living room, but then when I walked into the living room, there, that's where the, 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 my mom and my dad and my brother and my sister. Hey, I, want, I want to back up. The detective is trying to establish a motive and lock Stewart into a story he can't go back on. You're saying you left school. Last bell, last bell rings at 3.20 p.m., right? Well, we have administration saying you signed yourself out at 1.35 p.m. What? So you were not at school. So if you could help me understand... No. Or... That's wrong. I left at the last bell. They, if they said that, then they just got the numbers wrong. You're asking me to trust your word over the administration of your school. Why, yes. would, why, why would your name just show up? I, they freaking lied. I left it at 3.20 when the bell rang. I went straight home. So administration's lying. Yes. Are the cameras lying too? Detective Stuckman initiates the first big confrontation by revealing that he is in the possession of evidence that contradicts Stewart's original story. What? Cameras? If I were to tell you I had video proof of you leaving the school at 1.35 p.m. I'm just, I, I'm trying to, just help me understand because everything's pointing to you not being at school. I was. They it probably puts did, you they, in the time frame. Of what? I think you know. Without directly saying it, Detective Stuckman is heavily implying that Stewart had something to do with the murders of his family. This marks a dramatic tonal shift in the interview. No! But I need you to tell me what happened. I did tell you, I told you exactly what freaking happened. Was I left school and I went home? I, the, the clocks. Do I have to go get the, do I have to go get the tape to show you? I'll give you one more chance. When did you leave school? 320 at the last bell. Detective Stuckman leaves to retrieve his laptop while Stewart waits anxiously. However, Detective Stuckman soon re-enters, seemingly unable to locate his laptop's location. Finally, five minutes short of two hours later, Detective Stuckman returns, laptop in hand. Now before I show you this video, 
Your story is gonna stay the exact same. Yes. You left school when? When the last bell? At three three twenty. I told you that. If it says on video another time, then the clock setting's probably wrong on the video. Clock settings don't explain this. Never gonna give you up. Never gonna let you down. Never gonna run around and desert you. These are the lyrics to Rick Astley's 1987 hit, Rick Rollin' Around, and as you just saw, Detective Stuckman has pulled off a successful Rick Roll. He proceeds to let the remaining 3 minutes and 27 seconds of the song play out. I'm, I'm confused. I'm confused. Sorry, say that again. I'm, I'm confused. Jinx, you owe me a confession. Known in the criminal forensics field as a double whammy, Detective Stuckman hits the suspect with a perfectly timed jinx, just moments after executing an overwhelmingly successful rickroll. Typically, a jinx only results in one party owing the other party a soda pop. However, in a legal setting, the suspect now owes the detective a confession. Detective Stuckman's quick wit and clever forethought might have just expedited the confession he so viciously craves. Well, actually, I have my fingers crossed under the desk, so it doesn't count. Fucking shit. This is probably what the detective is thinking at this very moment. In a devastating blow to Detective Stuckman, the suspect has outmaneuvered the jinx by having his fingers crossed, rendering the jinx null and most certainly void. However, Detective Stuckman has one more trick up his sleeve that the suspect will never see coming. I, I don't know what to tell you. I think you left school early, you went home, Obviously upset at the fact that you couldn't get your name legally changed. Your parents were keeping you from that. I think you went home, and I think you did something that you regret. You're still sitting here trying to tell me the same story. That you had nothing to do with what happened to your family. That you didn't kill your family. Yeah, I... Is that what you're going to continue to say to me right now? Yes, I didn't kill my family. I I already said it and when I told you I'm not lying, I did not kill my family. I just want to make sure that I'm hearing you crystal clear. You did not kill I, your family. I did not kill my family. So I'll allow you to hear Detective Walker. Throughout the interview, there was something right under our noses that most of you probably missed. On several occasions, Detective Stuckman can be seen checking the time on his watch that was strapped to his wrist. And this wasn't without reason. Mere seconds before Stewart uttered the phrase, I did not kill my family, the wristwatch struck 12 a.m. November 20th. That's right. Opposite day. It was opposite day. The day when everything is opposite. With the confession he needed, Detective Stuckman calls Detective Walker back into the interrogation room to place Stuart Pecan into custody. Don't get up. Don't get up, son. Am I being arrested? Don't place your hands behind your back. <laughs> On reviewing the footage, one of our hawk-eyed analysts pointed out that when the suspect stands up, his shoelaces appear to be tied together. Further combing through the footage would reveal that when Detective Stuckman was searching for his laptop, he had laid a trap that would only be sprung at the very end of the interrogation. That's right. While searching under the table, the detective had covertly tied the suspect's shoelaces together, 
adding the cherry on top of the proverbial Sunday of justice. Why did I do? What did I, what did I do? I didn't do anything. I'm telling you, I didn't do anything. Stop. Stewie Griffin was taken into custody by the Spankingham County Police Department, where his bond was set at a shockingly high price of $80,085. Stewart's trial would begin four months later, where he would ultimately be found guilty on one count of mamicide, one count of papicide, one count of brothercide, and one count of stabbing his sister to death. Despite his age, Stewart was tried as an adult, and a jury ultimately found him guilty on all charges, sentencing him to four consecutive life terms, with the possibility of parole after his second life sentence had been served. We reached out to Stewart through email to see if he would be willing to share his side of the story and answer some of our questions about the case. At first, we didn't hear back, but when Stewart finally responded, he stated that he would only participate in the discussion if we met his list of demands, including $35 be placed into his commissary account, a portable DVD player, and the Family Guy Freakin' Party Pack DVD box set collection, which is valued at $199.87. We did not agree to any of his terms, and are still waiting to hear back if Stewart will speak with us. Despite everything, Stewart has managed to sustain a decent following on his Everything Quahog YouTube channel, even posting the occasional Family Guy-related video from within the penal confines of the Hecox Correctional Institution. Stewart will be eligible for parole in the year 2160 when he is 174 years old.